Hello and welcome to the Gag of Challenge, and if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samuel Whitley, <laughs> with me today, for once, awake, uh, Johnny Apple and colleague uh, Peter Lavelle. Uh, so Peter, we, we've been talking in recent days, I think even in our last podcast, about uh, NATO's growing uh, recklessness um, in Ukraine, in which they've now decided to double down, uh, not alter uh, course, um, but to head towards a, uh, a collision with um, Russia. And this is coming out with all the kinds of statements from, I mean, we talked about David Cameron giving uh, the, uh, uh, the Ukrainians, you know, absolute carte blanche. Yeah, you know, you can send, send these uh, missiles we provided you into Russian territory. We've heard about Macron saying, yep, you know, can't rule out um, deploying French or NATO forces. Uh, and, your, and your girlfriend, Kalis, she's saying, it, send it Kaya, to Exactly, Kaya Kalis is saying that. And um, and then uh, we had Anthony Blinken, um, who, who was, uh, you know, was, he was in uh, Ukraine um, the other day, also saying that. Um, and um, it, it's it's very, very um, troubling in all sorts of ways. So I just want to show you um, something. First of all, um, this... Uh, this comes from a um, uh, a Russian uh, magazine. This is um, um, a military review, which is pretty straight down the line. It's um, kind of you know not, not, neither particularly propagandistic nor uh, anti uh, Kremlin. And so he says, how Russia should respond to a strike on the strategic radar of an early warning system, because that's what happened. Ukrainians yes. uh, hit um, the radar of an early warning system inside Russia. And, and this, we have to assume that wasn't by accident. Ex exactly. And what this article points out, well, you know, this has nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. So why are they hitting these, this uh, early warning system? Um, because that the whole purpose of that is just to alert Russia to a nuclear, possible nuclear strike. And so therefore you have to think, well, Ukrainians aren't doing that because that's not an issue that should uh, concern Ukraine. But it does concern NATO, it does concern the United States. So then, the ra then that raises the question that under the guise of these are Ukrainian attacks, essentially NATO is making strategic attacks on Russia and pretending that this is somehow, oh, this is all Ukraine. We're, we're just, we're just uh, hel helping Ukraine defend itself. So it says here, the other day, the armed forces of Ukraine tried to disable using an unmanned aerial vehicle, the strategic stationary long range over the horizon radar of the Voronish uh, missile attack warning system in Krasnodar territory. Such an attack could not be an in independent initiative of Kiev and is probably a fulfillment of wishes uh, from Washington, London and Paris, which have nuclear potential. And then the thing is that uh, the mentioned object has nothing to do with Russian air defense system in Ukraine. It is an element of Russian strategic security. Space defense and detection of launches of various missiles at enormous distances. And then he goes on, um, blah, blah. And, um, but it's disabling, disabling at the hands of the Ukrainians could well be of interest to Western countries because this is a good opportunity without attracting attention to try to deprive Russia of its eyes in the southern direction. Voronezh DM in uh, Armavir looks with one half at the Indian Ocean and in the other at southern and central Europe, Mediterranean Sea, North Africa, and the Middle East. Um, and then he goes on, taking this into account, we should expect attempts by the Ukrainian armed forces to disable the Voronezh uh, radar in the Leningrad region, which operates in the meter wave wavelength region and so on. This should help the West reduce Russia's defense capability in the northern direction so that Moscow loses the ability to timely detect launches of missiles with nuclear warheads aimed at it and accordingly quick react, quickly react to what is happening. In addition, by the end of 2024, a modernized early warning radar of the Voronezh family should be put into operation near Sevastopol, which will operate in, in four bands. Of, uh, therefore, attempts to disable these facilities cannot be regarded only as attacks by Kiev in a conflict with Moscow. This is an attack by the entire peace-loving NATO bloc. So this is really very, very... It's very, very provocative. Yeah. Um, and you have to think yeah, that this 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 really goes beyond anything that, oh, well, we're just help, helping 
Ukraine defend itself. You are now launching attack. NATO is launching attacks on Russia's strategic capability, the strategic defense um, against uh, NATO uh, missile attacks, and pretending that this is just uh, this is just Ukraine. We're, we're not yeah, but th but this is so much more dangerous, and this is equally dangerous for NATO, for goodness sake, because yeah. if if you disable um, uh, it, even partially this um, radar defensive system, then the 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 possibility of miscalculation, misunderstanding soars. Yeah, Absolutely. and you want to what, uh, oh, um, given the um, the tension now that uh, between Russia and NATO, this is, George, this has nothing less than suicidal thinking. It is. Okay? It really because is. everybody is on a hair trigger right now, okay. even more so after this attack. This is, this is beyond insane. I mean, this is almost getting to the point of a death wish. It really is. Because you have to then wonder how long the Russians can really put up with this. Because you're now, you, you are making strategic attacks on Russia's capability, Russia's capability to defend itself against um, uh, a U.S. missile attack, a nuclear uh, attack. And, and to, to protect the West, and to pr actually protect the West um, to avoid a misunderstanding. Yes. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it works for both sides. Yeah. No, e exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is, this is an, an extraordinary uh, a da dangerous uh, action. So here um, we have an interview with our friend Stoltenberg. Um, he's he's doing a lot of these interviews. Apparently, he's going to be leaving quite soon. But I, I'm still not convinced that Stoltenberg is actually going to go. I mean, we, we, we sold we're 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 putting money on we're putting money on that he's staying here. I I do find the rubric of this interview quite interesting. George, tough talk. <laughs> Well, we haven't had any tough talk uh, directed towards him uh, since he's been uh, uh, been in that chair. So we'll see what tough talk looks tough like. Tough talk. Tough talk. NATO's boss wants to free Ukraine to strike hard inside. He's going to be hard inside uh, Russia. Jens Stoltenberg says the rules on using Western weapons should be eased. Yes, but see, again, everybody, language is so important to what George and I do here. NATO's boss wants to free Ukraine. Well, U Ukraine is defenseless. It has no agency whatsoever. Right. It can't even keep the lights on. Right. So who wants to do what to right. Russia? NATO wants right. to do this. That's right. That's right. Exactly. NATO, exactly. That's exactly right. It's NATO that wants Ukraine to attack Russia on its behalf. And so it's, this is now not even just we're fighting to the last Ukraine, and it is no, we're using Ukraine to attack Russia on our behalf. We want to we want to actually uh, destroy Russia, and we're going to use Ukraine to do so. Um, anyway, so he he goes on here. Uh, so NATO Secretary General do not normally attack the policies of the alliance's biggest and most important member country, but Jens Stoltenberg, whose ten years stint in charge is coming to an end, has done just that. In an interview with the Economist, he called on NATO allies supplying weapons to Ukraine to end their prohibition on using them to strike military targets in Russia. Mr. Stoltenberg's clear, if unnamed, target was the policy maintained by Joe Biden, America's president, of controlling what Ukraine can and cannot attack. With American supplied systems. Now, I have to say, I, 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 I foresaw all this is pure theater, but I do find it interesting how Biden has suddenly become a kind of a um, an object of maybe criticism, derision um, among elites. This was not, you know, just a few months ago. Uh, you know, it was not so not just on the issue of Israel, but suddenly Biden is in the way of our uh, waging this war. On Ukraine, and so we who read the tea leaves just wonder what actually is going on here. Whether has the or the important people, the World Economic Forum, NATO, um, the EU, IMF, everybody, have they decided basically Biden isn't worth uh, investing? Well, it, it it's in. interesting because there's not going to be any overt, no. um, direct uh, criticism. Right. But reading between the lines here, I think it's fair to assume is that. All right, Mr. Biden, this is your war. Yep. We get it and we've gone along with it at great expense and detriment to ourselves. But Mr. President, this is your war. 
we need to win it yep. with you or without you. This is what this is saying. I, I, I agree. And I think there's a symmetry here also with the Israel thing that somehow uh, they don't because they're convinced Biden hasn't done, you know, what he needs to do. I mean, with, with now that isn't quite NATO. That's more with the, the the Zionist lobby in the United States, who are very, very rich and very, very well connected um, to all these hedge fund billionaires who had been supporters of Biden, are suddenly thinking, well, Biden, maybe he's anti-Semitic. Maybe. Well, he's... well, no, George, but I mean, it, it's like, you know, this if we could use the casino <laughs> as a metaphor, I mean, they well, these people want to cash out. They want their they, they're cashing their chips out. I mean, this we've been doing this Biden for your entire political career. Now right. we're call we're right. calling it in. Okay, right. and you know you have no choice. Right. No choice. Okay, right. that's right. Exactly. But this but this also applies in a different way to NATO. There is symmetry here. Yeah. No, I, I agree. So then he goes, the time has come for allies to consider whether they should lift some of the restrictions they have put on the use of weapons they have donated Ukraine, said Mr. Stoltenberg, especially now when a lot of the fighting is going on in Kharkiv, close to the border, to deny Ukraine the possibility of using these weapons against legitimate military targets on Russian territory makes it very hard for them to defend themselves. Oh, this is complete nonsense. This is ridiculous. What does this have to do with Kharkov? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, just like we were talking about, what does that that attack on that uh, uh, early warning radar system? What has that got to do with Kharkov? What's it got to do with any with any of Ukraine? But you see, this is the lie that they're putting out. Well, it's just about Ukraine defending itself. Um, and then it goes on. It has long been a source of frustration for Ukrainians that if they want to go after targets on Russian soil, they must depend on home-produced drones, which have only limited utility. Their anger has been boiling over since March, May the 10th, when the Russians began a big offensive uh, across the border, only 20 miles from uh, 20 miles from Kharkov, Ukraine's second biggest city. It has been the subject of pulverizing aerial bombardment for several months before. Um, now, the, all this stuff about you know the, the home-produced drones, I'm not real sure they are home-produced. Um, and they, they, you know, they, they've been using them quite extensively. So now apparently, oh, that's just rubbish. Oh, no, 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 that, that, that's no, that's no use. Now we want to, we want to do uh, the missile thing, and 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 this is a way these media report. Every time there's some new weapon system that, that comes in, unless we use this, then Ukraine's done. I mean, you know, whether it's the Leopard tanks or whether it's the Atakums or the HIMARS or you know, you, you know, even now it's we we gotta let we we if if they don't hit targets inside Russia. We just can't win this war. It's it's always and on comes. Uh, well, it's in, it's interesting, is that um, again, you know, uh, how you um, contextualize everything. Um, who's who's going to lose this war? Is it Ukraine that's going to lose this war, or is it NATO that's going right. to lose the seat? They they they're conflating the two. Right. Okay, but you, you this attack on this radar station that what's going on in Kharkov is, is neither here nor there when it comes to attacking. Uh, Russia uh, inside of Russia proper. Anyway, everybody, you, you, m m m drones and missiles are constantly attacking in inside of uh, right. by from uh, Ukraine into Russia. This is nothing new. Nothing, no, exactly, exactly. But now, but they've they've created this new story. It's like the the leopard tanks or the uh, the Taurus missiles. Unless Germany releases the Taurus missiles, we can't do anything. So now, unless Biden. You know, you know, lifts the restrictions on Ukrainians using uh, American missiles on Russian territory. We're done. So they always create this um, scenario, and on comes Timothy Garton Ash to write a column. Wow, this is uh, you know, America has this obligation to Ukraine. We in the West have an obligation to Ukraine. We must allow them to use these uh, missiles on Russian territory in the name of the fight against Hitler. Yes, but in the name of saving NATO, this is see, they created this scenario, okay? And it was one day we might find out who was doing all the calculations, and they all should be uh, shamed for in public forever. But um, it, it, it's the what they've done is George is that they have made this choice. We've said this over and over again. They, if you made the choice about security, then we'd be having a different conversation. But no, it it is we're putting. All our money on one number right. on the roulette right. table. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, 
and um, was that it? Was that the previous one? Uh, yeah, that's all the other. So the next one is in an interview with uh, AFP on May the 17th, Vladimir Zelensky, Ukraine's president, pleaded for permission, please, 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 to use donated weapons on targets inside Russia. So, you know, he's always, you know, he's a miserable little pleader. Um, he's always, you know, oh, oh, give me these tanks. Give me the Abrams tanks. I, I, that's all we want. We just want Abrams tanks. And the plea, you know, we need to um, uh, um, uh, launch these uh, missiles. He emphasized that their use would be defensive. That that's a, it, it would be defensive. It's, it's it entirely defensive. The, the attacks on Russian territory are entirely defensive. Okay, everyone, just going to dispel this nonsense here. When you're in an active military conflict, defensive, offensive, what's the difference? None, okay, none, it's none. one of these myths that they they're always not, throw out they there. Mean nothing, but it's something that, of course, Stoltenberg, Stoltenberg, you know, says this. You know, I mean, we talked about Orban the other day. He said, "Well, in the moment you're fighting in another country, you're not defensive anymore." You know, and he, and he said what well, we've said many, many times here on the gaggle, which is. The moment you're outside NATO territory, you're already in violation of Article One of uh, the NATO treaty. So that you know the whole idea that this is defensive, attacking Russian territory um, is ridiculous. Uh, when Russia when Russia was trying to exploit shortages in manpower and munitions, the latter the result of delayed support from America and those unfulfilled promises by Europe, Western governments, he said, Ukraine to wanted Ukraine to win in a way that Russia does not lose. So this is just the usual kind of uh, rubbish. Um, no, but and also, George, I mean, I, again, this is something that the, um, we, we can um, okay, let's, let's go through what's true and what's not true, trying to exploit, okay, well, Russia is not reacting particularly to what Ukraine is doing. It has its own game plan, and George, I've been critical of it, by the way, of this very slow-moving 600-mile, 1,000-kilometer um, front. Okay, there are shortages, okay, shortages of munitions i'm not really convinced of that i don't think there's been really any interrupt the six months interruption i don't believe I that for a second okay that's care. not how the, the logistics work okay right. yeah. i mean ukraine could lose this conflict tomorrow and weapons will still be sent exactly. there yeah okay? that, that's always a nonsense exactly Absolutely. yeah it's all okay uh, okay so delayed in um and unfulfilled promises by europe yeah europe over promises a lot okay and and one of the reasons why it over promises is that you know, you'll have a group of people that a gaggle, as it were, of politics. Yeah, yeah, Europe is going to do this you know, based on what decision? OK, well, a sovereign government of the commission. Right. You know, there's, there's always we have more people flipping their gums than right. people are actual decision makers here. Right. Right. No, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> but but you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, the business of weapons and munitions, this is always used in order to gin up oh let's let's send some more because they're running out of ammunition they're running out of weapons I mean, it's, it's it's untrue but it's but they use that so sort of, oh oh look at this delay you know there's no no evidence that there's any shortage of uh, ammunition and then and you, Russia, Ukraine to win in a way that Russia does not lose. What's the evidence that somehow somebody does not want Russia to lose? I mean, that that there's not not at all. But you know, this this is the kind. Of, but it, it, it's again, you know, it, it's one of these um, failed creative writers uh, writing uh, majors at university that didn't make it, and then they go into government and come right. up with a cute little phrase like that's that, it. which is absolutely meaningless. That's right. That's right. Um, and then some Western analysts say America has sought to micromanage the way in which Ukraine fights ever since the war began. Well, who who would have thought that? Who would have thought that? <laughs> <laughs> and you think, well, first of all, um, you know, uh, why why is that surprising? Once you start sending in, I don't know, hundred billion, two hundred billion, who who knows how many billions of military aid and welfare payments and everything else. I mean, you're trying to usually say, well, we're going to micromanage how you spend this money. It's our money, after all. I was like, oh, oh, microwave. I always like the Western analysts. Who, who are these Western analysts? That well, you, you know, George, I mean, I, I, if you want to bring up micromanage, well, let's bring up something that some uh, some people have actually heard about. And that was that Istanbul process, OK? Who micromanaged that? OK, apparently, and we have this from witnesses on the Ukrainian side yeah. saying it was basically a done deal. Yeah. And then the micromanager shows up and says, Micro no, you're not going to do that. That's the best example of how this has been micromanaged. OK, okay. that's absolutely right. Yeah, that, that's right. But it's it's very interesting that that point, which we talk about it a lot about the Istanbul 
It's hardly ever appears in the Western media. You know, the economists, no. the economists can go on and on and on about Ukraine. They never mention what happened in Istanbul. You know, apparently that isn't an example of George, micromanagement. George, it was okay. So that's that's basically April, right? April, April 2022. Yeah. So at the end of the summer, everyone, I want everybody to clutch their pearls right now. Um, Fiona Hill and Angela Stint in foreign affairs, months and months and months later. And it was like, oh, my God, we made a podcast on during those days. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Talking exactly about that. That's right. That's right. Ooh, and, and, and not only uh, not only did it take months and months to kind of, well, well there might have been, you know, that kind of mumbling along. And and now, and even there's an admission of that. It, it, today, it's still brushed over, uh, right. it, it, or not even mentioned. All. It's always, you know, what you you don't say is is, is is the crime of these people. That's right. That's it exactly. <laughs> time after time, the Americans have denied Ukraine weapons it urgently requested, only to relent many months later. Well, what does that mean, only to relent? I mean, it means they didn't deny them. I mean, if you say, well, all right, the Americans have denied. They never denied them. That's, that's like, well, then they relented. They didn't relent. They gave what they always intended to give. <laughs> what, 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 I know you, you're educated in many different um, places and different times in your life. But, you know, if I had written that sentence <laughs> in my grammar class, my teacher would have hit me with a ruler and said, yeah. but they did relent, Peter. Okay, <laughs> so why are you writing such a silly sentence? Exactly, they denied, and then they relent, but they obviously didn't deny it. <laughs> and time and time again, it's like, go back to time. the blackboard. No, you and can't write have it. it. Yep, you can have it. <laughs> go back to the blackboard. Write it. Write until you. And, and if you can't, you can't go home. No lunch for you. No recess. You got to stay here with a dunce. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> The list included the HIMARS multiple rocket launch system, Abrams tanks, F-16 fighter jets, <laughs> Johnny Apple has joined us, F-16 fighter jets, and ATACMS, a tactical ballistic missile system. So oh, everything was given. Whatever you wanted, they got. Oh, it was denied to them. Um, and then it goes on. The justification was always that America wanted to avoid prompting an escalatory response by Vladimir Putin, especially the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Oh, 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 oh uh, suddenly tactical nuclear weapons. Okay. Tactical, exactly. Right, they, this article does the, the escalation ladder seamlessly, doesn't That's it? That's right. That's right. It's the tactical nuclear weapons. After France's President Emmanuel Macron mused in May about deploying NATO forces in Ukraine, Mr. Putin ordered nuclear drills to be held in Belarus. Yet apart from the saber rattling, nothing has come of Russia's nuclear threats. See, now the problem is that they always say this, well, nothing has come of Russia's nuclear threats. This is a kind of, you know, you, you, you're sort of whistling past the graveyard um, because <laughs> this, so Russia's a nuclear power. You can't go on just sort of say, oh, well, we, I know you're not, 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 nothing has come of it. Yeah, so we, we can just do whatever. Yeah, Leah, let's, let's hit their, yeah, but see, uh, it's something... uh, you know, their nuclear bases. You know, they're not going to do anything. You see, but see, here's the fundamental problem. And George and I have talked about this before. There is, a, there is an assumption built into this ridiculous article is that deterrence no longer works. But see, the Russians do think it works, okay? And so we, if, if deterrence has to work if both sides understand the equation. But just be and whistling past the graveyard, what a wonderful phrase, because that's exactly what this is. The, the fact that they have these training exercises, which was planned before, they make it sound like, oh, so oh, all of a sudden you woke up in the morning. No, this was in train, everyone. Right. These things you can't just do at a snap right. of a figure. You, right. it, it's not, that's not how these systems, it's very very sophisticated right. and many moving parts. And you just can't make a phone call and say, have a work by the afternoon, okay? <laughs> Come yeah. by for drinks later. No, it doesn't work that way. No, the, it, but this, but this, the, the West is deteriorating the idea of deterrence. That is nightmare thinking, everyone. Exactly. It is deteriorating because precisely that's what the West was committed to right up to Ukraine, which are all the years since uh, 1949, when Russia uh, first uh, um, declared that it had the atom bomb, the first uh, test of the atom bomb, that's 1949. So that's 75 years you've accepted that you don't want to mess with a nuclear power. Um, all, every president has said, we just don't go there um, until now. And you say, well, it doesn't matter because Russia's not going to do it. They're just simply going to bluster and, then, and they're not going to do it. Well, how do you know that? 
I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like arguing with somebody who has a gun. Well, he's not going to use it. Oh, and how, how, how do you know that? And, and if you start hitting their strategic sites, then they, they're going to think, you know what? You're actually making, you've already essentially declared a strategic war against us, and you're hiding behind Ukraine uh, to do this. You found a, key, a, a very clever little thing. You think you're being very clever that, hey, we're not actually doing it. We're just getting Ukraine to launch these strategic attacks against you. Uh, you, you can't touch us. We're not a was, part of uh, the conflict. Was that part of the little bag of tricks that Victoria Newland was boasting about on her way could, out? Could well be. Could, could well, well be. be. Um, and then Mr. Stoltenberg acknowledged the risk of escalation. Good. The task, he said, is to prevent this war becoming a full-fledged war between Russia and NATO in Europe. <laughs> but he drew a distinction. How, how can how can you take this person seriously? He, he's had that job for ten years, and he, you know, and that's that's how he he knows how to keep that job. Um, um, this, it's but, almost like you know, George. Oh God, just let me be bad one last time. That's what this is. <laughs> but he drew a distinction between the supply of weapons and training and military engagement. We provide training, we provide weapons, ammunition to Ukraine, but we will not be directly involved from NATO territory in combat operation over or in Ukraine. So that's uh, a different thing. Now, notice what he said. We will not be directly involved from NATO territory in combat. Of, so we will be involved in combat from Ukrainian territory. Right. So NATO is a combatant because it's in it's Ukraine. in Ukraine, exactly. But we won't do it from NATO territory. Well, of course, you're not going to do it from NATO because if, if you do it from NATO territory, then you're going to, you're going to be attacked. NATO territory then becomes um, a, a, a free fire zone. Mr. Joel Stoltenberg drew a similar line on the suggestion of stationing troops in Ukraine if its government requested them, an idea championed by Emmanuel Macron. Uh, he said, well, that's not the plan. We don't have any intention to send NATO ground troops into Ukraine. Ground troops. Ground troops, exactly. So, you know, he's always making these kind of, you know, that's how he gets kept, gets to keep his job. You know, he well, makes... what, what does he mean by ground troops like wearing NATO uniforms? Yeah, exactly. Or, exactly. or just be... fatigues? Exactly. You know, it could, be, could mean almost anything. He says, you know, NATO ground troops. You have no idea. What about NATO, NATO aerial troops? I mean, you know, like, uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't mean anything. You know, he's just making all these fine legalistic distinctions. So, so no, I, 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 I am not changing my position. Because our purpose has been twofold, to support Ukraine as we do, but also to ensure that we don't escalate this into a full-scale conflict. <laughs> so, uh, because there's, there's, no Russia... amount, there's no argument anyone can make to me that hitting that radar station uh, was uh, solely, or even had anything to do with the Ukrainians. No. It solely had to do with NATO, solely. If, exactly, exactly. And and again, NATO thinks, well, we're really very cute. We're just gonna be use the, we're gonna be attacking Russian territory, using Ukraine to do so. And then, and then we'll say, well, it wasn't us. You can't, you can't do it. You can't attack us because we, it was Ukraine who did it. You know, we, we, you know, we, we're, we're not a party to the conflict. It's Ukraine what did it, um, and they're making strategic uh, attacks. There are now signs America may be moving towards allowing Ukraine more leeway in its targeting. After visiting Kiev last week, Antony Blinken, America's Secretary of State, is reported to have made the case in Washington for allowing Ukraine to hit military bases and missile batteries a few miles inside Russia. Missile batteries, oh, that's good. Um, and these are being used to pummel Kharkiv and the troops defending it. Um, a few days earlier, David Cameron, Britain's foreign secretary, has said Ukraine was free to use Britain's British-made storm shadow cruise missiles and strike targets in Russia. Lloyd Olson recently hinted that Russian aircraft launching glide bombs from Russian airspace might be legitimate targets uh, from, for American uh, missiles. So you know, you, you're basically you're talking about a major American military operation against Russia inside Russia. Uh, you know, and and they're thinking that the, well, it's just Ukraine that's doing it. None of this has anything to do with Kharkov. They're trying to make it, this is about Kharkov. It's nothing to do with Kharkov. The, the problem with Kharkov is they, the um, money designated to creating these like um, 
uh, tank traps and all of that. Well, it was they were made, but they're just dumped uh, d- dumped on the side of the road. They were never implemented, and the money disappeared. Okay, right. so you want to talk about the problems of Kharkov? Right, exactly. No fortifications. Yeah, yeah. Um, yet Jake Sullivan, America's national security advisor, has consistently urged caution. So now they're dumping on on Sullivan. This is the you, this is a theme coming up. You know, a number of articles. Somehow it's all Jake Sullivan's fault. Yeah, but it also, George, again, I think this is this is just some kind of uh, propaganda trick. Mm-hmm. You know, they're thinking very seriously, about, you know, very judiciously and soberly, you know, these great minds, they get together in a little push and back and forth and all that. It's all nonsense. OK, yep. this is all BS. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but and I, you know, the national security advisor, he, he, he's not the one who calls the shots. The national no. security advisor is the one he just simply coordinates all the various agencies. That's the job of a national security advisor. You know, you know, he basically he's there to pre- prepare a briefing for the president. He doesn't get to decide policy. His job is to make the president look good, everybody. Exactly. And yeah. you don't have to know anything about national security or geopolitics to have that job. That's he, right. Jake Sullivan is a perfect example of that. You're absolutely right. And we've had a number of national security advisors in the past who knew nothing whatever about foreign policy. You know, they were just good bureaucrats. They knew how to play the bureaucratic game. Or they were drinking buddies. That's right. That's or right. card playing. Oh, that's right. That's right. Ronald Reagan, had he appointed a number of yeah. those people because... Those are the people he liked. And I don't with. remember there was that one guy. Judge Clark. Huh? I think Judge Clark. I think the, the one who was a real, just a, an old Reagan crony. Yeah, because he. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure if it's the same guy, but he always referred to Reagan as RR. Okay. Yeah, maybe and he, Clark, sh- yeah. He, sh- he showed up at his uh, confirmation here. He's wearing cowboy boots, you know. And they asked him, you know, what is the capital of Indonesia? And he said, basically, I'm paraphrasing everyone. Is it important? <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> I think that was Clark. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he got the job. He got the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but he didn't last long. No, uh, uh. Mr. Biden takes the same view. It will not have calmed Mr. Biden's concerns that in April, Ukrainian drones took out a high value early warning radar station for tracking nuclear threats. That was some 360 miles inside of Russia. That's the way they put it in this bland way. It will not have calmed Mr. Biden's concern that in April, Ukrainian drones took out a high-value early warning radar station for tracking nuclear threats. Now, George, exactly, George yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you how important I think this is, is that Russia would be perfectly justified to take out an, a high-value early warning radar station anywhere in Europe. I now. agree. I absolutely agree. Anywhere in Europe. Yeah. And I think they should, to be honest. I think they should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, because, you know, you know, you have your pet project. It's called the Ukraine project. okay? And it's a it's great to make money. You get people going to buy houses in the Hamptons. okay? you can uh, uh, have um, uh, uh, claim to be American first and uh, uh, Ukraine first. It's good for for politicking. This is serious business. okay? the rest of this is, is such a fiasco, right? But this yeah. is different. It's exactly. very different. It's very different. Exactly right. Mr. Stoltenberg seems well aware of the asymmetric advantage Russia derives from what amounts to a grant of sanctuary from American long-range weapons. Sanctuary from American long-range weapons. I mean, can, can you imagine what you're actually saying? You're getting a sanctuary. Apparently, we Americans have a right to attack uh, Russian territory with our long range weapons and but you don't have a right to retaliate against any nato territory let alone uh, the united states or to sanctuary we'll provide the russia with a sanctuary from long range uh, uh, weapons this allows russia to concentrate forces safe in the knowledge that ukraine cannot use its most effective weapons until they cross the border they're not ukraine's weapons no. they're not ukraine's weapons and again how you know if you're fighting around kharkov how is it helping you if you're attacking, you know, you know, Russian early warning system or Russian missile bases or, or, or Russian military bases deep inside Russia, um, they can lo- also they can also launch weapons such as Lancer drones from Russian soil in relative safety. We need to remember that what this is, Mr. Stoltenberg said passionately. 
This is a war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine. Ukraine has the right to defend themselves, and that includes striking targets on Russian territory. So this, how does that justify NATO destroying an early warning radar right. system? That's right, exactly. And again, if you say Ukraine has the right to defend, defend themselves, which is very dubious, NATO doesn't have the right to attack Russia. That, that has nothing to do with anything. What you're saying, when we have a right to de defend, attack Russia, why? Well, because Ukraine has a right to defend itself. Well, what There's... about Russia? What about Ukraine? I'm sorry. What about NATO attacking Russia? Does Russia have the right to defend itself? Well, exactly. Well, that's the point. I mean, exactly. If you're going to start talking about defending themselves, then Russia has the right to defend itself by attacking NATO territory. And so this is basically NATO has declared war on us. We're now attacking um, NATO territory. Um, and then he says, however, Mr. Stoltenberg distinguishes between allowing Ukraine to attack targets in Russia with donated systems and any direct NATO engagement in this conflict. <laughs> you always say this. <laughs> That's a predecessor... difference without a distinction, my goodness. Exactly. That's right. Um, his predecessor, ah, this is, I always like this, when, when they're introducing Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who is working for Ukraine, they never, they never mentioned that he's working for Ukraine, he's on, he's on their payroll, called on May the 14th for NATO countries in Eastern Europe to be allowed to use ground-based air defenses to shoot down Russian missiles and drones aimed at Ukraine. So he's basically, Rasmussen, the previous Secretary General, says, NATO countries in Eastern Europe should be allowed to use their systems based in those countries to shoot down Russian missiles and drones aimed at Ukraine. Um, and presumably, it's, the assumption is Russia won't hit those um, uh, NATO well, uh, systems. Uh, let, let's just put it this way, George. Um, uh, Russia knows where those systems are. Okay. I, I would have thought. I would have thought. <laughs> Mr. George, Trump George, George, you and I were prescient from the very beginning here, because I I can rem I don't remember the date, but in the first few conversations podcasts we had about this, we both agreed that Article Five will be tested. This yep. is the evidence here. Yep. Okay. Yep. It, yep. It, it, and this is again a craven choice on the part of NATO to do this. Right. Right. Ex ex exactly. It's it's a, absolutely NATO's choice. There was no need for this. NATO did it. And then Mr. Schulpenberg rejected that. Oh, I rejected it. This is this is this is the kind of thing you know. You, you some we, we will not be part of the. We will not be a party to the conflict. There wouldn't be a conflict if <laughs> if, 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 if you if you had if you um had not been part of it, there would never it, it, been. There would not be a conflict. In fact, you made yourself a party to the conflict. We're, we're party to the conflict. Um. So now here's something I, I wanted to show you. This is Radek Sikorsky, one of, one of the truly loathsome. Yeah. <laughs> Figures of our time, it's hard to think of anyone as loathsome. Or maybe his his wife, um, um, God, what, 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 not, not her name. Uh, um, uh, Applebaum. Uh, Applebaum, exactly. Uh, uh, the, the, this, this Anne, 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 Anne Applebaum, exactly. Which they never say that they're married. They, they never, yeah, exactly. They never say that. <laughs> Polish foreign minister calls for long term rearmament of Europe. So, so he gave an interview to the Guardian. Um, and he calls for long-term rearmament of uh, Europe. And he says here, you know, long-term rearmament of Europe in which U UK can play the closest possible roles necessary to defeat Russia's imperial ambitions. And, uh, and then Sikorsky also called for majority voting for EU sanctions and a 5,000 strong EU mechanized brigade. He said Poland was willing to back an EU-wide scheme to incentivize Ukrainian draft dodgers to return to their homeland. Now, Incentivize. Oh, yes. I just love no, that. No, Incentivize. I mean, there's a number of things right away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> notice they, they just flatly declare them as draft dodgers. There's no there's not even any quotes or anything like that. The Guardian just simply flatly declares them to be draft dodgers. Um, they are, I mean, they're basically people just they want to, you know, they want to stay alive. <laughs> you know, they, 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 the most basic human instinct, they want to stay alive. <laughs> Um, the most basic human instinct, everyone, is fight or flight. Okay, exactly. that is our primordial instinct. Exactly, that's, a, that's what our our very being is about: fight yeah. or flight. Fight or flight. Exactly, like you know, the animal world. Yeah, um, and uh, and but then he says, "Well, it's necessary to defend um, to defeat Russian imperial ambitions." You remember? I mean, I was thinking about that debate. You remember when he and um, 
and uh, McCall, Mearsheimer and Waltz. Yeah. Yeah, again, Mearsheimer and Waltz. And you remember how they were ridiculing, absolutely ridiculing the idea that uh, Russia had any basis to fear NATO. And and as we pointed out at the time, Mearsheimer and Waltz walked into the trap of agreeing that Ru the Russia's fear of NATO was irrational. Of course, that disgraceful performance, they lost the debate. And, you know, understandably, once once they accepted the premises that Russia was irrational to fear NATO, then... Um, but but Sikorsky has now dropped the mask, as we'll see in this interview. He doesn't even... Well, I mean, the, that NATO, uh, Lloyd, yeah. Lloyd, during that debate, Lloyd Austin was quoted, uh, the, the, the primary, again, quote, um, paraphrasing here, uh, goal of the United States is to weaken Russia. And Michael McFowell got really upset about it. I, you know, he shouldn't have said that. That was a mistake. Well, it was really embarrassing. We, the whole debate was really it was It was an embarrassment. Okay. It was a disgrace. When, when, when um, Mearsheimer and, and Waltz, they, they caved on their... I think they were given the the first chance to speak and they caved They caved yeah. in on their yeah. own. Yes. They, they, out of the gate, they, they, they gave they, up the debate. They gave up the debate. Once they said, yeah, it's irrational. What Russia did is stupid because great powers behave stupid. Well, that's it. You've lost the debate. You've, 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 you've basically, you've, you've agreed with the, the premises of the, your, your opponent. And then, well, oh, again, look at this. Here. Sikorsky has also called for majority voting for EU sanction. Okay. Um, again, you guys, you know, I lived in Poland for many years and this is, this, this was part of the Polish complex here is that the, the Poles have this, um, perennial um, insecurity um, that they're not a major player. And this is the way to get them to the adult table, okay? And of course, this is to British media, a long-term rearmament of Europe in which the UK can play the uh, the closest possible role. Again, you know, it's the 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 Poles and the Brits, you know, you know with these French and Germans, you can't count on no. them, okay? No. You no. can't count, they're not reliable. No. We're reliable. We're okay? reliable, exactly. We've seen That's... this over and over again. That's right. It, it's a, it's a, the, the bizarre phenomenon of Poland, the most belligerent uh, nation in Europe. The French and the Germans supposedly are total wimps. He, he dis well, I mean, the, the George, but it, look at the historical irony. I mean, almost every single major conflict in modern European history has been in Poland, okay? Right, right. And yeah. around it. I mean, this yeah. is the last, you know, this game. Like, we, we have a long term vo uh, view here. Right. And I think everybody should have some security because you know what? Major countries like Poland can disappear for a century, well, they, and they, it they, did. They, 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 they can, and and that's that's really the thing. And the, um, you know, P Poland, it came into being in 1918 after uh, disappearing for more than a hundred years. First thing it did, it kind of antagonized. It's it's partly you know it's neighbors you know you got the Soviet Union in the east Germany in the west they managed to antagonize both until they sort of figured you know they they came together and said you know what why don't we just sort of bring the Poland to an end I mean that you know it it doesn't serve any useful purpose to keep the state uh, going hey you know at the risk of being a real nerd here I mean every time Sikorsky talks it reminds me of Joseph Beck of the interwar period. <laughs> This this ridiculous cartoon figure that was the uh, Polish foreign minister, and he he presented himself as a modern day Metronik, and he was going to resolve European right. security issues and all that. He he was just really um, a worthless alcoholic, okay. But he was always he was never short on words, okay. And Sikorsky reminds me of him every right. time he opens his mouth. Yes, it's very funny because uh, you know I I remember Sikorsky when he was uh, kind of a uh, writing for various neocon magazines in the 1980s. Now, he, he, he was in Oxford. So obviously, MI6 must have made contact with him in Oxford. I mean, he's a Pole. He comes to study in the UK. MI6 had to have made uh, contact with him. And so he, when he was writing these articles in National Review magazine, um, and, you know, he was utterly contemptuous of the French and the Germans, you know, they're, they're, they're wimps. They, 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 back then, it was the Soviet Union was still in existence, so they're wimps. They, they don't have the guts to stand up to the Soviets, you know. They, 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 and then he, I remember he would write about the French. The French caved to Germany in 1940. You know, they, you know, these pathetic power, you know, were wiped out, you know, in a few weeks. I thought, 
why is the poll saying this? I mean, the polls were pretty much wiped out as you know <laughs> as quickly in, in, in six as, weeks. In exactly. Six I mean, I, I you know I don't know if the, you're in any position to start you know casting aspersions on the French. Uh, the only you know the, it was it was the Russians and only the Russians who managed to sort of withstand uh, defeat from the Wehrmacht. But that the he was this disdain that he as a poll had for the French, but he's retained that. Throughout his, uh, uh, his his career, I never thought at the time, incidentally, that he would he would then emerge as this major well, uh, it, political it, but figure. But also, in but also, Poland is still making the same mistake yeah. that Joseph Beck made in 1939. Right. Is that you know, with European um, 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 security arrangements and alliance, we can survive? No, you're making the same mistake again. Yeah. Okay, exactly. again, exactly. because exactly. the people that you call wimps. And losers, the French and the Germans. Well, they well, they read your text, erratic. Right. They know how you feel about it. Yeah. Why should they put their security at right. risk for Poland? Yeah. It's history yeah. repeats itself. No, it, it, exactly. Because you always think that well, sooner or later they'd have to get fed up with this. They're going to say, you know, like what was it? Jacques Chirac said in in two thousand and two at the time of the preparation for the Iraq invasion. He said. Uh, about Poland and I think the Baltic states, they lost the golden opportunity to keep their mouths shut. Um, like, you, know, you, you lost this opportunity to keep your trap shut. It says, in an interview with The Guardian, Sikorsky said Poland backed the right of Ukraine to strike at military targets inside Russia, arguing that the West had to stop constantly limiting itself in what it does to support Ukraine. Um, again, you know, you're basically, you're, you're blurting out everything that uh, the Russians were saying. NATO is a threat. The U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has been holding out against Ukraine using weapons on Russian territory. Again, you know, they've now targeted Sullivan. Sullivan is the sort of the, the, the bad guy. You know, that's this is the Guardian. The Economist said the same thing. You know, he's somehow um, uh, limiting, limiting Ukraine. And I wanted to show you something truly well, disgusting. Sorry, can you go right back before we go? Yeah. Oh, uh, I know, but that, that's as good a uh, picture as worth a thousand words. Exactly. Um, um, okay. In the interview with the Guardian, Sikorsky said Poland backed the right of Ukraine to strike at military targets, arguing that the West had to stop. Well, I mean, so is Poland going to be spearheading this for for the Ukrainians, or is it NATO? Is it the United <laughs> States? I mean, Sikorsky has this really bad habit of sp speaking out of turn for other right. people. Right. That's right. But back the right of Ukraine. So that's so. You got to keep in mind, Sikorsky wants this war. I mean, he he wants a war between Russia and NATO. So he's really just basically saying whatever it takes to get this war off the ground. And so that's oh good, okay, yeah, Ukraine. Because I mean, that's the only reason he's he wants Ukraine to start hitting targets inside Russia because you know in the hope that this is going to uh, trigger a war. Quite why he thinks. Poland's going to do well out of this war. And I mean, that that's that's the mystery. Well, the, the thought that comes to mind, I'm, I'm pretty sure he has an American passport, too. So. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, his wife yeah. is American. So, right. yeah. yeah. Um, now, this is picture. This is something so repugnant. I mean, I don't I don't know how well you can see. Um, this is um, Annalena Baerbock and Radek Sikorsky. And this the guy, the nerdy looking guy is France's foreign minister. Um, Stéphane Sejourné. And they, they, this is obviously some, this is a recent meeting of the Weimar Triangle. I don't quite know what they're grinning at or what they're laughing about, but they look to, totally repulsive. I mean, yeah, George, when, when you heard, hear the word Weimar, do you ever smile? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. But they, they, they just look, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I... Well, see, but this is, this is the theater of of uh, of projecting Western power, it's feel good, it's mm -hmm. happy, it's mm -hmm. smiley. Yeah, these are you know the weighty issues of war and peace. You know, there that's not displayed here. Okay, no. The, no. The, the, this is NATO expansion, right? With a smile, with a smile. Yes, exactly. We're yeah, grinning, grinning. You know, we 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 we're, we're great guys. We're really likable people. Well, they went to, they, they were at Oxford together, at least yes. Baerbach and Sikorsky. Yeah, 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 yes. And again, if you go to Oxford, you are going, they're going to, the intelligence services, certainly MI6 is going to approach you. Um, the CIA are going to approach you. And there's, there's no question. I mean, these are, these are all kept uh, individuals. They're kept these by the Western intelligence said services. Said differently, these people were are successful by design. That's right. That's right. 
And Orban was also at Oxford. Sure, you know, MI6 made made their approaches to uh, Orban. You know, hey, you're you're our guy to run Hungary. He had just come from a meeting in Berlin with the foreign ministers of France and Germany in the so-called Weimar Triangle format, a grouping now seen as the new political powerhouse of the EU. Powerhouse. 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 Whoa, whoa, whoa. Political powerhouse. Um, although he but said could Russia they, was... Could they pick a different city like Baden-Baden or something? <laughs> I... Yes. <laughs> Although he said Russia was winning mainly small Pyrrhic victories, the Weimar group backed a broadly drawn attempt to fill big gaps in EU defense capabilities formed at the end of the Cold War. So you know, these three characters that jo George just presented, the, 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 this is the, you're, they're betting the farm on these three people. That's okay? right. That's right. Annalena Baerbach, I have no idea what her origins in politics are, but she is way out of her depth. Yeah. As far, you know, it, 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 uh, not long ago, George, being the foreign minister from Germany meant something. It doesn't mean anything at all now. No, no, exactly. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I think there were terrible people. Like Hans Dietrich Genscher was. Yeah, he was time. there forever. Yeah, he but... was there forever. But at least he knew something. I mean, yeah. you know, he may not like him, but he did. He knew something about international affairs. Baerbach. Uh, knows absolutely nothing. Just he goes said, to one cocktail party to the right. next. Exactly. Um, Poland is spending 4% of its GDP on defense, and Sikorsky said other countries had catching up to do. Well, if Russia was such a threat, you would have thought they would be 40%. But well, That's right, exactly. That, 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 that's right. I, that's the, the, they never can refute that argument. I no. say I use that all of the time. If you're so afraid of Russia, why don't you spend 2% of your, um, right. uh, exactly. your budget on defense if you're so terrified? Exactly. And why, why did you send all of everything you've got in your armory to Ukraine and left your country defenseless? I mean, if, if yeah. Russia is such Look a... At, a yeah, we know that you know Denmark sent those two U-Hauls you know, <laughs> across Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish somebody would have just filmed it. You know, this is the the entire contingency of the Danish support. You know, I mean, <laughs> it might be vintage World War II vintage stuff. Yeah, we know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said this required a military reorientation, adding that during the period of the peace dividend and expeditionary warfare, we focused on high value, high tech platforms and weapons. We are only now rediscovering that actually you just need millions of shells. You need large volumes of low-tech stuff as well. So he's, so he's got a, the task of millions of shells. Millions. <laughs> um, yeah, he's channeling his inner Bismarck there, isn't he? Yes. Okay. He's a great, great, you know, um, military thing. No, everybody, this is such a sad comment on neoliberalism. You just gut the industrial base of your country. You know, one country that didn't do that was Russia. Russia right. has a highly integrated military. The Chinese are making the dip. No, they're not. There's no evidence of it at no, all. The Iranian know. drones. Uh, well, as far as I know, they might be making them in Russia. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah, I know. But, I, yeah you know, yeah. but, you know, no, no, you know, all of it. No, it's because you did this to yourself. You yeah. deindustrialized. Right. You gutted your industrial. But you financialized everything. OK, yeah. you dumbed down your societies, destroyed your culture. OK, right. and, and 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 now you're waking up, you know, uh, peace dividend. I don't even know what he's talking about. NATO continued to expand. Yeah, peace. Yeah, I don't I, I guess he means. The, that's the in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. Is they say, well, again, that 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 wasn't there was no there was no peace dividend. They immediately, within uh, a few hours of the uh, end of the Soviet Union, they began expanding NATO. I mean, it, it didn't take long. I mean, it, it was really done. Literally within a few hours, they started it. He admitted European defense manufacturers still did not feel that the process of rearmament was permanent. Permanent. We want permanent rearmament. And said Vladimir Putin was spending forty percent of GDP on defense. See, how does he get that forty percent? I mean, maybe he means forty percent of the budget, but forty percent of GDP on defense. No, it, but it's, even the Soviet Union never spent forty percent of its GDP. No, right defense. now there's it's estimated to be six point seven to seven Something like that. That, that's, yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Now maybe he means forty percent of the budget. Yeah, it's a like common it, mistake from right. morons. Okay. Yeah. I've uh, even heard, I've actually heard economists. Right, exactly. Because that, that's the only thing that makes sense. Because again, even the Soviet Union never, never spent no. that. Um, 
and said, and would eventually bankrupt this country by making the military so resource hungry. Russia has three and a half million people in the military industrial contrast. By contrast, Europe um, didn't just disarm, it de-industrialized in the defense field. And he said, he said, companies were telling me, we read in the newspapers that there is all this demand for armaments, but we are not getting the long-term contracts. And if we don't have 10-year contract, we are responsible to our shareholders. We can't make the investment. So he's basically, he wants, we want long-term contract. In other words, he wants essentially Europe on a permanent war footing. You know, we want long-term contracts with, uh, with the armaments makers. What, well, I think that, what happened? He's not talking about Ukraine anymore. Yes, not the, <laughs> yes what happened to Ukraine? He, Ukraine just kind of drops out of the conversation. Right. Exactly, exactly. And again, you know, goes, oh, just, wasn't that, you know, I, I keep thinking about that debate with Mearsheim and you kept ridiculing the, the, uh, Russia thinking there was a threat from NATO. So it's about guaranteeing them that this is not just for tomorrow, but this is a long-term rearmament and a change in security. So, so he's saying, you know, look, this is a long-term rearmament. So it's a long, Europe has to be on a war footing, permanent war footing. Well, that's, that's nice. What Brussels wants. That's is what Brussels wants. That's right. And that's where, that's obviously where, where uh, we're heading. And then on setting sanction, he said the Weimar meeting had agreed to advocate for the EU to take on a fuller coordination role. We should drop the principle of unanimity and sanctions. So forget, you know, everybody has to you know, be in agreement on sanctions. We just simply impose the sanction. It says some of them have been delayed by one member state blocking them. Huh. I wonder who they're talking about. And also, it should be an EU crime to breach EU sanctions and therefore prosecutable by European Prosecution Service. So that's that's nice. So breach EU sanctions and therefore prosecutable by uh, the European. So imagine they, they're, they're essentially going to tell uh, countries, uh, you're not going to get your gas anymore from Russia or oil anymore. And if you do, we're going to uh, punish you. We're going to prosecute you by the European Prosecution Service. I, I don't know whether that's a, a, a plan, an EU plan that's going to succeed well, in, I mean, in, in continuing the EU. Radic, you know, you, you give me some more details here, because we all know that Russia's uh, amped up uh, crude oil exports to uh, India. India is refining them and yes. sending it selling it to Europe. Is yeah. that breaking sanctions? <laughs> at a markup. At a, at a substantial markup. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, you know, that's that's a good question. He probably will say no, because a lot of people are dependent on that uh, re-imported re oil. I think he probably means just hitting Hungary. Um, what I... Yeah. We, yeah, what I yeah. what I what I like is the 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 what was it the famous friendship between Poland and Hungary? You know that, that oh, yeah. great the great bond that's supposed to unite Poland. It's and a Hungary. myth. It's a myth. It's a complete myth. Yeah, everyone, yeah, yeah, okay, when you live in Eastern Europe, you hear that you say, you know, in Eastern Europe, there's this eternal bond between the Poles and the Hungarians. Okay, it's not true. No. Why do they? Why does this myth persist? Because they never bordered each other, okay? Right. Because everybody in Eastern Europe hates everybody in Eastern right. Europe, okay? Right, right. yeah. <laughs> Particularly the countries that border you. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then Sikorsky, a long-term student of Russian methods. Russian methods. How do you get to be a long-term student of Russian methods? What, and what, what are Russian I... methods? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what Russian is this methods... A, is this a drinking game? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I wonder if you can get a PhD in that. I, I want to get a PhD in Russian methods. Uh, you know, I, I, want to, I want to write a, a quick doctoral dissertation on Russian methods. Um, he warned. And they, again, they don't even put quotes or anything like that. This is The Guardian. So there's, as if there's something called Russian methods. Um, warned that Putin was trying to woo the right in Europe and the U.S. by weaponizing traditionalism. Is there anything Putin hasn't weaponized? I mean, I think yeah. the, you know. Is it like, I mean, now you know you weaponize energy, you weaponize food. Uh, now you're apparently weaponizing traditionalism. Um, whatever that is supposed to mean, I, I have no idea. Um, and then, what, what, what is it to woo the right? Uh, you know, the people that are against neoliberalism, yeah, people exactly. against the du uh, du the the uh, uh, duopoly in power, right? 
okay, uh, against wokeism. Right, right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, what? what? <laughs> but who, 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 whom is he wooed? Because, uh, you know, what we call the right in Europe, they, they're all very anti-Russian. Even Le Pen, Le Pen has gone has been anti-Russian for quite for a long time. Um, when we know about Georgia Maloney, I mean, there's who, who which, what is it? The, the Conservative Party in the UK. Where is this right who are being wooed um, by, by Putin? The right, or, 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 or as, we've, gonna... as we've said so many times, uh, you know, um, you do you have if you, you're considered to being wooed by Russia if you don't condemn them, okay? Yes. I mean, what, what this is this, this is what this this um uh speech pattern that they, you you have to de denounce you right, have to right. do you now do you denounce this before right. the conversation begins okay right. when it has nothing to do with the conversation that's, that's right but the denouncing but these these right-wing leaders they have denounced russia i mean they you know le pen maloney um salvini they have they've all denounced russia so you know where is this kind of pro-putin right he is an absurd leader of international conservatism. We are talking about a KGB colonel, for Christ's sake. I, I, I love this. A, 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 they always bring up the KGB colonel. The 1980s, which was 40 years ago. I mean, you're talking about what he, what he did this is 40 years ago. I mean, this is... This is well, the... I mean, okay, irrespective of this hyperbole, it, 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 any... Journalists worth his or her salt to say, well, have you ever been an operative of MI6? Yes. Yes. What are your connections to the CIA? Right. I mean, if you're going to throw stones, can someone ask you a hard question? Right. That's right. I think the Russians about 15 years ago did some polling, or maybe they just noticed that on some issues like attitudes to homosexuality, gender, uh, to all kinds of identities, you can drive wedges in our societies. But none of that is even remotely true. I mean, if you think Poland is probably one of the most conservative societies on, on issues like homosexuality, that, that hasn't led to any particularly pro-Russian feeling. So, oh, well, they, well I, I agree with their view on uh, on homosexuality I mean, or abortion or whatever. I mean, it's just nonsense. They just make this stuff up. Um, but this is a staple of, you know, the, the Politico and the Guardian all this, oh, yeah. Conservative ideas, you know, Russia is, you know, is is uh, an advocate on behalf of conservative ideas. Well, and of, of course, you know, embedded in this, it's quite obvious there's something wrong with being conservative. But anyway, yes, of course. Um, on that, for example, Central Europe was ten to fifteen years behind uh, Western Europe in attitudes. Well, thank God that they're catching up. Well, and, and if you're if you don't get on board, you're punished. You know exactly. that Poland, Poland, you know that. <laughs> that's that's right. It's very it's it's very interesting because Poland, you know, as relentlessly Russian as anyone in Europe, still gets punished because it's you know, hey, you don't have our enlightened views on um, on gay marriage. Um, he, said, he said Europe had to learn to play the escalation game better by keeping Putin guessing about its intentions. Um, asked whether it was permissible for Ukraine to strike military targets inside Russia, he said the Russians are hitting Ukrainians' electricity grid and their grain terminals and gas storage capacities, civilian infrastructure. The Russian operation is conducted from headquarters in Rostov on Don. Far from not using nuclear weapons, Russia does not limit itself much. Well, Russia does actually limit itself uh, quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> quite a bit. You, I do mean, you think that you think their clown Zelensky is going to show up at this uh, um, uh, uh, um, fake peace pr uh, process uh, um, uh, uh, conference in Switzerland? Of course they will. The airport right. is working. People exactly. are flying in and out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Something that the Americans would never do. I mean, the Americans wouldn't just allow, you know, you know, say Saddam Hussein or Milosevic to travel around and say, you know, without shooting down their plane. I mean, you, you know, you travel, you know, the Americans are going to shoot down your plane. The first thing they take out is the right. airport. Exactly. Um, more broadly, he argued, always declaring what our own red line is only invites Moscow to tailor its hostile actions to our constantly changing self-imposed limitations. So we shouldn't have any self-imposed limitation. We should declare our red line and we shouldn't even tell Russia what our red line is. Uh, well, that, that, that's great. I mean, that's, uh, you know, another, you know, you read this and you realize this is a guy who wants he just wants war. I mean, that, that, that's basically so we shouldn't even, you know, we have our red line, but we shouldn't even spell out to the Russians what, what our red line is. We should just simply, you know, 
basically hit them. Um, you know, and the interesting thing, every time we look at these articles, there's never a hint, you know, like, well, how can we resolve this? Right. Never that. There's never, that no. lane is permanently no. closed for these That's people. Right. That's right. That's right. Ex exactly. Um, and then he goes on. He was skeptical about Russian threats to use nuclear weapons. <laughs> okay. Okay. Again, if you don't, you at your peril, if you um, uh, cease to believe in the theory and practice of deterrence, we will all pay a heavy price. That's right. The Americans have told the Russians that if you explode a nuke, even if it doesn't kill anybody, we will hit all your targets in Ukraine with conventional weapons. We'll destroy all of them. Now, he says this, <clears throat> and you kind of wonder, what's your basis for saying this? Have, uh, have you, you heard know? anything like this? I haven't I heard anything like this. No, but he says this, but, you know, is that what they told him? I mean, it is, but um, no, this is like breaking news. I've never I, heard of anything. I've like not that. heard this. He says the Americans have told the Russians that again, he's Poland's foreign minister. So he meets all these Blinken and all the rest of them all the time. Is that the case? Is that what the Americans have said? That if you explode a nuke, even if it doesn't kill anybody, we will hit all your targets in Ukraine with conventional weapons. We'll destroy all of them. Well, that will be an existential threat to Russia, which Russia will react. Well, exactly. That's the moment they do that. That means it's just war, automatic is war with the United States, because that, as you said, that's an existential matter. And therefore, uh, it's all out war with the United States. Which, of course, is what he, um, he, he wants. I think that's a credible threat, says uh, yeah, Sikorsky. Is he also, agreeing, the... is he's agreeing with himself. I, I... <laughs> yes, he's agreeing with himself. Also, the Chinese and the Indians have read Russia the Riot Act. And it's no child's play, because if that taboo were also to be breached, like the taboo of not changing borders by force, China knows that Japan and Korea would go nuclear, and presumably they don't want that. Okay, um, again, the, the Chinese canard. Okay, fine. Right, yeah. that's right. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to um, show you that as like, this is, this is a person who's taken seriously as a kind of a major... Uh, NATO European uh, statesman, and, uh, and <laughs> it's actually they they're moving inexorably towards uh, war, um, and 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 I do think that you know we were talking earlier about that that Tory MP who said that after Starmer becomes prime minister they're going to announce formally that, that Britain is now at war with Russia. I, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds plausible that they basically, they want to get this election out of the way. And you know there is something very strange about um, Sunak declaring this election. You know, I mean, you, he's still got seven months to go. Uh, he, he's down 25% in the polls. I mean, you know, he, the Tory MPs would kind of wonder, hey, we're going to be out of a job. At least we would have had another seven months to look for other work now you're basically throwing us out onto the street within a few weeks so it's a it was a strange decision and you kind of wonder what what was behind it because everyone is now rallying around starmer it's like starmer is the anointed one you can think the media politico everybody is now already rallying around him telling us what a fantastic guy he is you know nato is in you know, now has a safe pair of hands uh with uh with starmer <laughs> safe pair this is just the intentional, eyes wide open, lunge into right. the abyss. It, this is so extraordinary. It's all, why is this all happening? Because the Ukraine project is failing. It's failing badly. And they're going to tie everyone's train to this. Okay, we all going to go down together right. over this. A man in Kiev that is no longer legally the president of the country, um, this talk about democracy is a farce, um, and there's no talk of peace feelers of a no. of a, of a, a cessation of hostilities, talks, anything. Okay, the Russians have been very open to it. Okay, it would be very very hard. They have the upper hand. That's why we have all this saber rattling. Right. Right. It, and it has nothing to do with security. It all has to do with ideology about who they think they are right, right. Uh, and 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 it's it's very colonial thinking in, in, uh, on their part okay right. they have to subjugate there's this 
it, it's messianic, must destroy. Right. No, I, 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 I agree. But this is when um, worlds become very uh, dangerous when you have um, essentially great powers saying, well, we can't back down. We have to go on because if we back down, then essentially we have to we admit defeat, we admit uh, humiliation. So therefore, we have to up the ante and hope something or other works out. And yeah, but see, but... NATO has got itself into position where we can't back down because if we back down, then Russia will have won. We can't we can't allow that. So we have to go escalate to the next step. That's how you lose using that thinking. That's how I you. Agree. Lose, okay? I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, it, it's it's so absurd because it's it's self referential. I mean, it, it, it it's a self fulfilling prophecy. I, okay? I, I agree. That, I, is, that is why that is why great powers usually don't go down this ridiculous path because you can lose. Right. Okay, you right. can. Okay, the Soviets were and the Americans battled it out in Angola. Remember those days, yeah. George? Okay, Swapo. Oh, I can remember all the acronyms right, right. now. But when the dust all settled, there was still the Soviet Union and there was still the United States. That's, that's exactly right. But of course, you know, we have the examples of the two world wars in which the, the powers that were the great powers in 1914 just simply they disappeared from the map because you're not supposed to go to war against other great powers because you do then indeed disappear. That, that was the lesson of the Napoleonic right. Wars. Right. That was the lesson. Don't do that. Okay. Right. And for over a hundred years, they had all their little proxy wars in the Balkans. Right. And, uh, you know, and we had Crimea and all of that. Right. When you go head to head on the continent, someone right. is going to lose if that's the path you go right. down. Now you can, there, there's a, there's many, many ways to get out of this, okay? No one, neither power will get everything they want at this right. moment, at this right. moment, right now, Right. okay? There's still a lot of room to wiggle everyone. Right, right. no, I, I think that's right. And that's why, uh, you know, I, I don't find it implausible what that Reuters story said, that what Russia is willing to settle for. But the fact, what's interesting is that it, as a deal, it's not a great deal for Russia, but even this deal, which is not a great deal for Russia, it, 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 NATO just flatly rejects it. Flatly reject what, which would be, I think, you know, given you know, essentially NATO hasn't lost any lives. Yes, and NATO could say, "Hey, that's a that's a pretty good deal. We should just take it." No, no, no. We're going all the way. You know, we're going to you know, we're, we're going to bring Putin to trial. We're going to bring him before the ICC. Well, that's it. That means you're just going down this path. You know, this total path of the devastation. The, the, the pathetic thing, George, as you and I have reflected upon many times, is that, well, if it's a bluff, call his bluff. Let's see. Let's right. just see. Right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Call the bluff. Right. That's right. I mean, you say that he wants to conquer all of Europe, rebuild the Soviet Union, make all these ridiculous claims. Right. Well, why don't you test it? That's test right. It. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. You, you, in other words, precisely, you make all these claims. Oh, he's going to, you know, he's not going to stop. He's going to march to the channel. And yet, you know, this story, this Reuters story, it's consistent with previous stories showing, you know, Russia has got very, very limited uh, ambitions. Test it, you know, say, hey, you know, instead they say, no, 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 we can't do anything. We can't possibly deal with Putin because, you know, he, he, he won't stop there. You know, he's going to move on to something else. They, 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 go out of their way to reject any possibility well, of a, a peaceful settlement. You know what they're afraid of, George, is that the, if there's just a crack in the window for, you know, okay, we, we're just going to stick our ear. What do you want? Right. And the reply is a neutral Ukraine. Yeah. That, they won't know what to do. Right. That, because that's what was proposed before right. or all of this. But, but, but the interesting thing is that that, which is an extremely reasonable uh, outcome, the, the public is always kept in the dark about this. No, you know, the, I bet the European public, the American public has no idea that that was all Russia wanted. From the start, that all Russia wanted was a neutrality. They didn't want any territory. They just wanted neutrality from Ukraine. That all, that's always kept out of the media. Oh, Putin wants to restore the Russian Empire. Putin wants to restore the Soviet Union. Putin isn't going to stop. But it's very important to keep the public as ignorant as possible of what was the original aim, what, what was uh, Russia's original intent. Because otherwise, people are going to say, you mean you wage this, this war which lost so many, cost so many lives for this, 
And what is wrong with neutrality? But you know, the, 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 I mean, why why is there such a terrible thing that a state is neutral? Good, they can have a nice, peaceful life and enjoy enjoy prosperity. Why, why do countries be, why do countries become neutral? Uh, because it usually works better out. That right. the the outcome is usually better. As a matter of right. fact, I think almost always better, right. with very few exceptions. Right. Okay. Yeah, it means you are not going to. Uh, form an alliance with one hostile power against another. You're just not going to join and you know one uh, uh, alliance against another. That's it. You're not going to wage war against somebody else. That's all. That's all the neutrality means. And that's somehow, oh, this is just so awful. Ukraine is a sovereign government. Ukraine must make its own decisions about its military alliances. No, not if it's a threat to somebody else. And that was enshrined in the whole Helsinki right. process. It's not right. like, but that has never happened before. No, you agreed to that. It kept the peace at the height of right. the Cold War. You, right. the West, agreed with it. Yeah, yeah. It's not a new idea. None of this is. No, no, no. <laughs> it, 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 you know, I, I don't want to sound so pessimistic here, but you know, I'm glad we're doing this, George. This is, if there's going to be an, any historical record in the future, we're doing it right now. Right. Right. We're doing it for everyone right now. There are ways out of this, right. okay? And right. It, 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 it's, it, it, I feel dumbstruck at times when there's so many obvious ways to move forward for everyone involved. Right. And, you know, I, I, I've often said, maybe the best solution at the end of the day, because it will give it a, be, a, a more finality to it, that no, neither side gets everything they want. That might not be a bad idea. Okay. At least but it brings the, the way to an end. the way it's continuing. Right. You right. force right. maximalist positions on both sides. That's right. That's right. But it's NATO that is insisting on this maximalist position. So NATO's position is 1991 borders, and this is the bringing Putin to to justice, or rather putting him on trial. I mean, you know, this is, you know, and of, and of course, you know, stealing, you know, how much money from uh, Russia. Uh, this is nuts. This is absolutely insane. It means the war goes on. And of course, that's what NATO is about. You know, you look at those faces, those big grinning faces from Baerbach and, um, and, and uh, uh, Sikorsky. Do they look like people who are troubled by a war? Do they look like, you know, they, they you know, throw those faces that, hey, the, the, we shouldn't we shouldn't continue all the, the slaughter. We should bring it to an end. No, no, no. They're happy. That's why these big grins. Um, it's, you it's, know, it's, George, it's really interesting when you look at it from we can always use the benchmark of 2014. When of these people, the Berbox and Sikorsky's and the Jake Sullivan's and the Blinken's, all of them, when have they got anything right on this? They have consistently made blunder after blunder after blunder. And it's, you know, Putin, if, uh, Putin believes this, Putin, you know, in Putin's head is they've never gotten that right. How do you know that? Six, and, six. And, yeah. and, and, and and as things unfold, they're proven wrong every single step of the way. And now they want to take further steps. Uh -oh. Well, your road, your record is a disaster. But you see, Sikorsky, he was there February the 21st, 2014, guarantor yep. of that uh, agreement, of the agreement between uh, Yanukovych and the opposition. Again, no one challenges him on that. Yeah, you were you were guarantor. The whole point was that this was an agreement between government and opposition. Basically, um, we're going to put all this uh, aggravation to an end and wait for elections in December. And then within hours, it was gone. Did you express, you know, outrage? At the uh, at the government uh, at this coup government in uh, in Ukraine that just violated an agreement that you signed, you were there in the room. You were in the room, and, then, <laughs> and he, he's the one who's who's pontificating. Well, Europe has to you know has to become go put itself on a war footing, war footing because of you. No self reflection, no. and you know they always say. It, it, I've often said, you know, Western foreign policy is made up of two pillars. Number one, oh, that was a long time ago, so yeah. we shouldn't have to deal with it. Right. And something must be done. That's right. Neither have anything to do with history, with yeah. geopolitics, with strategy, with security. No, right. That was a long time ago, and something must be done. 
For sure. That's what the, that's all we're left with. And you know that's what? Right. It's it, it generates one disaster after another. But yeah, it was a long time ago. It was always a classic yeah. <laughs> because it's always like you know, you know, America. You talk about they they overthrow all these governments. Oh come on! I mean, we're not going to talk about Mossadegh and Arbenz. You know, that was seventy years. Ago. That was a long time. Ago. No, uh, let's talk about Yanukovych in 2014. We're not talking about something that happened in the 1950s. We're talking about something happened 10 years ago. Um, and then you, and there's others. Well, you kind of tried to overthrow Maduro in Venezuela. Also, that's five years ago. Don't give us this a long time. Oh, well, who cares about Mossadegh? You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, okay. That's yeah. 70 years ago. Uh, we're the talking about something that happened very recently. The problem with that is the Chinese still collectively remember the opium wars. Okay, right. Right. that's like you know, you, you you want us to forget about it, but right. you know we remember it. Okay, right. remember everyone the 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 industrial juggernaut of the world, China, was colonized by the right. West. Okay, right. Right. and that is something that's considered the century of humiliation. And when you're humi when you're in a position of strength, you want to wipe out that humiliation. All right. No, so. I, I think I think that's right. And the, the Iranians have also not forgotten about uh, Mossadegh. <laughs> and so, um, um, well, they and, haven't uh, forgot about the the war that everybody wants to forget is that it was unleashed by Saddam Hussein with the backing of the United States invading yeah. Iran, which was yeah. you know that was the the numbers the hundreds of thousands of troops that were killed and died and you had all of that um uh chemical warfare and all right. that that doesn't even that's not even a blip a blip right in in, in western policy thinkers minds so that's, right. that, that's it's very interesting to say that because of course <clears throat> Uh, it, there was an interesting debate the other day between Alan Dershowitz and um, Glenn Greenwald. Oh, I'm going to watch that tonight. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very quite interesting um, about whether to bomb Iran, and uh, you know, it, it, you can figure out who who's on whose side on, on that debate. But the interesting thing was that um, Dershowitz had advocated a, a regime change, obviously, in Iran, and the person that he wants to take over in Iran is the son of the Shah. I didn't even know the son of the Shah was around, the son of the Shah. And naturally, you know, he, he, he was reminded of, hey, haven't we already tried that, you know, regime change in, in Iran and inserting um, the Pahlavis uh, onto Iran. But what's interesting is what you just said about Iran and Iraq, about, oh, oh, you know, according to these Iranian, the mullahs, the Ayatollahs, they call America the great Satan. Well, you know, you know, why do you think they do that? Why do you think they have this animus towards the United States? Leave aside about you know the the in, the Pahlavis imposing the Pahlavis, but there's the Iran Iraq war that was done. That was facilitated by Jimmy Carter's big new Zhezhinsky using yeah. Saddam Hussein, launching this uh, uh, war against Iran. Yeah, that's kind of why they they call you well, the great Satan. Since it's been brought up, our really good friend, a, a, one of the most kind, dearest people you'll ever meet, and I've had the privilege to meet him a number of times, Mohammed Morandi. He was in that war. He was yeah. wounded, I think, right. at least twice. Right. And he was, uh, and it was uh, uh, the use of chemical weapons, courtesy right. of uh, the U.S. Defense uh, Secretary Weinberg. Okay, yeah. so yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Rumsfeld. Or I'm uh, Rumsfeld. 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 Yeah. Rumsfeld. Yeah. That's right. yeah. So. That, you know, that was a long time ago. Well, I think if you're the victim of a chemical attack, it will always be with you to, in every single moment of your life. And there are so many people in Iran that have that, scarred by that. OK, right. he, I've seen pictures of uh, the battalion. I don't know the military, his company or battalion or whatever it was. You know, not all of them made it, George. No, okay. no. It's a, it's a... So that's that, that's not long ago. That was a long time ago. No, it wasn't. Right. Anyway, and it's one of these things I'm sorry to this gets in my mind is that always keep in mind everyone the west always demands their narrative and their chronology you know, these dates are important well maybe to many people in the west but you know they, i remember a public opinion poll um it was like university of maryland or something like that and they were doing a, a public opinion polls in afghanistan and they asked them about 9 11 and they said what's that i mean like 90 percent right. of the what, what right. i don't know why you keep talking about this date what right. does it have to do with us right but see they have their the west always has its chronologies right. and right. it's a very neo it's colonial and a neo-colonial right. um uh, chronology 
October 7th, October 7th. Okay, that's the same thing. Right. Yeah. Nothing uh, happened before and it justifies everything after. Right. No, I mean, it, it, it is quite, <laughs> quite astonishing. I mean, even on even on things that like like say World War One, um, anyone in the West, they only know about what happened in France, the trench warfare in France. And you're saying, you know, there was quite a lot going on on the Eastern Front. There was a big, big war going on there. That, but I mean, almost no one in the West knows anything. They don't even know there was a war on the Eastern Front. There was a war, you know, in the Balkans as well. That was, that was quite bitter. It was also part of World War One, And that was a war in the Middle East, you know, with Lawrence of Arabia and, and everything else. So there's, there were a lot of aspects to World War One, But in fact, you know, the only thing... The British, the French, the Americans ever talk about is the Western Front, you know, the trenches and blah, blah, blah. And blah, blah. Um, it's a, it's, so even on that, even on something that is ours, part of our uh, yeah, but tradition, if, people a, have a very, a, very narrow knowledge of it. As a result of the First World War, the caliphate, the, the, uh, the caliphate that had right. lasted for centuries and centuries was dissolved. That's important to the right. Arab world, the Muslim world. That's very yeah, important. Totally, okay, exactly. that's an important date. Right. But does anyone, you know, the, um, 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 it, policymakers uh, in, in the in the West, do they ever think about that and what that means to these people? No, no it, it's, it's amazing, you know. Or right. think about the 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 Islanders uh, during the Second World War. The Americans like stood up, you know. And, We're taking this island. Right. Why? Because of uh, this, the, December seventh. Well, what happened on December seventh? Yeah. Why are you here? Right. What did we do? Okay. Right. okay. I mean, it was interesting. I saw this um, the documentary. It was translated from Arabic into English, and you know, you have the. Um, Rommel uh, and the uh, the Africa Corps and Montgomery and you know the and the lines going across North, but this way and then this way Alexander Trubok and all you know everybody people lived there right. indigenous people lived there you never see them in the documentaries no, do no, you no no you never no. there are no you know you it's like I I think even in um the world at war documentaries here this place was made for war as if it was empty no it wasn't empty okay and then to this day to this day they're demining yeah they're taking they're still finding mines that the Germans and the Americans and the British put in the ground but when you when you look at that they have no history okay it, it, they're, it, they're, it's null and void for them. And, that, and, and the reason why I bring that up is that more and more, and more the, the, the global South is saying, hey, we have our history too. We yeah. have a history and we're not going to live by your chronologies. Why should we? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. It's, it's, it's where you, you kind of create this history of what matters to you. And, uh, and so therefore, you know, and, Ultimately, you know, we, we get to Israel. It's a big subject, but again, what matters to you is what matters to Israel, and therefore that becomes your defining uh, framework for how to uh, look at the Middle East. And it's like we were talking earlier about how very cleverly Henry Kissinger made made it seem as if the only issue in the Middle East was, you know, our boys. And the Soviet boys. That this was really a kind of a proxy war uh, between the two uh, blocks in the Cold War, rather than well, actually, there's, there's something deeper going on. But nonetheless, Kissinger foisted this framework on Americans. You know, at, at his in his heyday when people just sort of sucked on his words. Oh, he really understands this. But it was a, a, a completely false framework, much like the framework now that we have, which is somehow. This is about some civilizational struggle between um, the Islamic jihadis and the Judeo-Christian world and, you know, uh, globalism versus nationalism. I mean, you know, you, whatever the fashionable paradigm is. Yeah, that's what this war is really about. Yeah. yeah. Really what it's about is a, a Western idea, the Westphalian idea of self-determination. Right. OK, and, 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 and again, the, the the West shames itself it's so much in public is that uh, an idea that the world has embraced a Western idea through a lot of violence by the way that's why they came up with it it's like we we, we don't come up with an idea like this we're going to kill each other or we're going to kill all of us okay and no it's just that you know you, you you have leaders that are elected by the people where they live okay very kind of simple idea don't interfere with it okay and that's what the Palestinians have been trying to do. Yeah.
I don't, that hard to figure out. It's, you know, it's complicated. No, it's not. When anyone ever says, well, it's complicated, you know they're lying, okay? Right. Because you know you hear this phrase and it's something I've heard all my life. The, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. No, it's usually 90% of the time it's in one, it's very clear what's right. Almost always, okay? Yeah. Well, now we got you know NATO uh, on on the on the march. NATO determined to impose a war. Kind of you know you know and you know obviously there's a, a you know a, a deeper agendas at work, but it's hard to see how we get off. That's 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 really the problem. That it's just you know that this it's so they're so now determined. You know we we looked at Stoltenberg. We looked at. Um, Radek Sikorsky, and we can go through others, Cameron and, and the rest, um, Keir Starmer. They are, they're just determined on this course. They, they have, they, they have yeah, no interest just getting off. Just, and last point here, and I'm not going to name names because it's not important, but you know there are those out there that some of you probably are listening to, and uh, is that you know this is you know about to wrap it all up and all that. Don't believe that. We right. are in a very, very Absolutely. dangerous time. Perfect. Right. And it, 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 again, you know, the Ukraine's on its last legs, you like to hear. Well, I mean, Russia has not liberated all of the Donbass. Exactly. Exactly. OK. Why? Because right. it was NATO fortified for eight years. Right. OK. Right. And relationships were developed. OK. Ukraine is corrupt as they come. OK. But even corrupt peoples want, you know, it, it, go, we can continue down this path and we're all going to become very rich, even if the country is destroyed. Who cares? Okay, that's what kind of clientele you're dealing with here. But I always am very hesitant, you know, you know, it, it, remember what Hitler had to say about the Soviet Union. All you have to do is kick in the door yep. and the whole artifice will drop. Right, right. That's what too many people are thinking that right now. Right. No, that too many sense. people. And the fact that we have, you know, these voices you know why is Sikorsky being you know you know given a, a platform like that his wife and Applebaum was on with Mika Zabr uh, Brzezinski about 10 days ago no no mention the fact that her father was probably the architect of all of this disaster <laughs> and the her, the guest is married to the guy that is yeah. the tool of that same ideology right. they never you know don't, don't ever give any details okay or all these you know um, armchair warriors that come on you know former general blah 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 oh yeah you work for Raytheon they never tell you they never tell you these things yeah. okay <laughs> no no this campaign that George and I have been talking about for the last few podcasts it keeps us up at night and I'm not we're not joking I absolutely absolutely I mean while this war goes on. There's, all, there's always a very, very real uh, prospect that is going to escalate into something very, very nasty and, and devastating. So, you know, the idea that, oh, well, it's just over and everything, Ukraine's on its last legs and, you know, that's it. No, no, no. With war, until it's over, you know, it ain't over till it's over. You know, that, you know so while, while it, it's continuing, all sorts of terrible things can happen. So... Um, and given you, 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 the, the this is a final note, guys. I mean, why did they trot out Victoria Newland last week? Exactly. Come on. Come on. Exactly. All right. And, and All right. right. Why is Sikorsky? Why does he get this sort of platform? He's just a foreign minister of Poland, and you get this platform. He just said, says all this stuff, um, uh, always unchallenged. And uh, so, and yeah. considering he said what. If the Russians use a nuclear weapon and no one is killed, that the U.S. will use all of its conventional. Yeah, exactly. Destroy, well, well, destroy well, all of. All, well, why, why, why is it that in the Washington Post and the New York Times right now? Exactly. What we say all of Russia's positions in Ukraine, in other words, ter inside what is Russian territory. So the Russian, in other words, the United States. He's saying United States is going to attack Russian territory. Um. Well, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, you know, Russia is going to say, "Oh, okay, well, that's fine." You know, the, you know, we don't have a problem with the United States directly attacking us on our own territory. We're not going to retaliate. Yeah, I mean, you know, exactly. That's what you would think a reporter would ask. Well, how do you think Russia is going to respond to that? Oh, okay. wow! You know, what wisdom? Okay, last word. Last word. I don't even think there was an interview. I think Sikorsky wrote the questions and he <laughs> answered his own question. I, I think this is a thing now. I agree with you. Actually, it's I very, think it's a I think thing. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. That, that's why. That's why. Been, why yeah. isn't there ever a follow up? Come on, you guys. It's because he wrote the entire interview. He interviewed true. himself. He argued with himself. He challenged himself. That's true. <laughs> that's true. 
That's I think that's right. And, and the, the Stoltenberg interview also read, read like that. He, he, exactly. You know, he's like, he just, well, he then made just, it's a series of statements. They're, ne they're never really, you know, in any way, kind of a uh, question and answer thing. You know, you say something and then the reporter challenges that. No, they're just a series of statements and they make it seem as if, well, he sat down for an interview with the, with the Who was it? We did it like last week, a, a woman. And I kept saying, nobody talks like that. Nobody <laughs> talks like that. Okay. Was it was it Victoria Newland? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, that's I think that I think that way. I think it was Victoria Newland. Yeah. Nobody talks that way. That's what you write. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The boys have to go out. Okay. Okay. No. We had terrible rainstorms today. It wasn't even the forecast. Anyway, this is the gaggle with Peter and George. We're on locals, so please go to the gaggle.locals.com. Everyone will be very happy to hear that since this is Sunday, George's first live stream is coming up. Yeah, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Apple. Please join me. Come with comments, criticism, ideas, suggestions, opinions. Everything welcome. Um, so uh, the, the- I was going to try to get Apple, but- It's okay. like, a, the, you know, so the guardians of the tip jar, again, say, I, I, I'm out of here. You know, I, I, you know I've got I'm more important things to do. But in, in spirit, they'll be there. So if you have a few bob in your pocket, uh, with him out, dunk him uh, in the tip jar. Maybe one day they'll show up again just to show their disdain, um, but I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> We're very grateful for all of your help, friendship, and support. The more you're able to donate, the more of these videos we can make, the more we can improve the technology. And above all, we might one day get to see these hounds again. Again, I wouldn't bet on it. Oh, oh, no. Oh doesn't show up <laughs> all right so remember if you like the gaggle please like share and subscribe see you soon bye